Hi everyone, today I'm going to be talking about Runtime Mobile Security. It's a really cool tool, uh, a web interface that hooks up to Frida. Um, there's a lot of cool features and I'm excited to do a brief overview. I plan on doing an, a part two uh, of this just because there's just so much um, different uh, capabilities for this. Um, yeah, so let's go down to installation. Now, uh, number one is optional, but I really, I highly recommend creating a Python virtual environment because it makes it a lot easier to manage your different tools and different Python versions, etc. If you don't create a virtual environment, it's kind of like starting out, starting a, like a pile of paper, and then a week or two goes by, and you end up having a bunch of different stuff added to that pile, and papers are going every which direction, and you're like, oh no, what have I done? I don't know what dependency goes to what, and I don't want to backport something and break another tool, stuff like that. So, virtual environments just like save your sanity. So, the Python docs are actually really readable and awesome. Uh, you should be using Python 3, so this command will work perfectly. Now I'm going to go to my terminal. Um, as you can see, I'm going to clear this real quick. I'm actually going to remove my current virtual environment I was testing with. To get out of the virtual environment, you just have to use deactivate. Um, so now if I use that command I uh, copied can create a new virtual environment and actually want to show you all the steps. So source um, is used to, to activate the virtual environment. So you do source RMS. Um, it is bin activate and then You'll, you'll know when you're in the virtual environment because you'll have the little brackets right here at the left side. So as you can see, I already get cloned the RMS runtime mobile security um, repository. So the next thing we do in order to install is we pip install the requirements file. And I'll just show you what's in the requirements. It's really, um, so like, there's not a lot of dependencies, thankfully. Um, so, you know, Frida Tools, Frida, Flask, and Flask Socket IO. And the command to, to install RMS is this right here. So you, you'll use pip um, with a dash R argument with the requirements.txt. And Flask is really awesome for creating web interfaces and for smaller projects, even bigger projects. Um, yeah, so let's let's install the requirements. And since I'm in the virtual environment, this will only install these dependencies in this environment. Uh, we have some BSD wheel errors, but we can ignore those. Um, so we want to go back. Actually, no, we want to go. This is where we can actually run um, RMS now. So we just do Python 3 and then the main Python file. So after that, we'll get um, the Flask server will start. And this is a development server, as the warning states. Um, you can actually change this port that it runs on and everything. But this is the, the default port that Flask uses always, uh, port fi uh, 5000. So now we can actually go. And it's because I'm not um, in the start area. Let's go back to device. There we go. And as you can see, 
it automatically detects my um, my emulator that's using AEVD and that's also specified which emulators you can use. You can use AVD, Jenny Motion, Amazon Fire Stick. I have so many questions about this. Um, yeah, so iPhone 7 and Chrome web interface. So now we can select the operating system and it, this list is everything that's on your device or emulator. So I can select injured Android, um, spawn if it wasn't running, but since it's running already, I'm just going to use attach. And I actually wanted, I wanted to try this feature out and show you guys this feature. You can run Frida scripts at startup, which is really awesome. So I'm going to run a Frida script that is used to bypass a Flutter SSL plugin. So I'm going to do, I'm going to put it right here. And start. And you can tell that it's running successfully because it shows the startup script process attached and the script's loaded. Um, from here, you just like load the classes of the APK. You can hook all methods. Um, I actually want to go back to load methods because there was nothing for it to hook um, and this search function is super valuable it makes it way it, really easy to look up methods for um, activities so as you can see here all these are all my flag methods for when um, the buttons are clicked and stuff yeah now let's go to the application because I preloaded that Frida script. I haven't tested it out yet. So let's go here and let's go to the Flutter area. I want to go to the Flutter SSL bypass. Now I can put in whatever website I want. I'll just use mine for example. Um, now check, and it should stay disabled, which it does. So it'll just, it'll just print disabled SSL pinning plugin for every time that the function is hooked. Now, another really cool feature of runtime mobile security that I want to highlight is this API monitor. Um, so you can select which APIs APIs you want to monitor. So I'm going to select the ones that I know for sure I'm using. Um, shared preferences, web view, and base64. And database. So we can start API monitor. After you start it, it's going to, all the um, outputs going to show up here. Okay, so now we can go back, um, and every time we switch web view, it should print to the screen, or to the console in RMS. Whoa, my uh, my emulator is acting acting up a little bit. Okay, there we go. Now, for example, if you go to the Firebase one, we should see the shared preferences being called, um, and we do. So let's see, update color view. There's a lot of web view calls here. Okay, so there's one of one of these for sure that are that's interesting is the Firebase call. So this uh, this is the Firebase database call, um, and this looks like the value, but they use web sockets. This looks like a base64 encoded value, um, but since this is with a web socket, it does if you base64 decode it, it's not the actual database value. Um, so let's go back to like test. And you can see here you can actually monitor the values that are being sent in. 
and you and we should see another comparison WebSocket. Actually, it probably just preloads at once since it's asynchronous. Yeah. So now that it loaded the loaded the value from WebSocket, um, if this value doesn't match, it's just going to just keep showing the values that are being submitted. So now let's go to a different one. Just um, out of curiosity, I want to see what uh, the SQLite one returns. So now you can see um, it's uh, it's catching my encrypted share preferences values, and that's being returned here. Now, unless you have the key, which is generated randomly um, by this encrypted secured preferences API, we wouldn't be able to decode that to see what the true value is in the in shared preferences. But the SQLite values, I believe, aren't really encrypted. Yeah. So you can see this is a test is plain text. This is only base64 encoded. Um, these byte arrays could be uh, just converted to string values. Uh, this is only base64 encoded. And so this is inherently like so, if you find something like this where you you can find just basic four encoded values that are being that are being um, written to SQLite database, uh, you could you could find like sensitive data in transit while the application is running that way. Yeah, this is another base sixty four encoded value, and for sure these these values are the flag value and the password value. Um, so, yeah, and this is where the SQLite calls start right here. Um, yeah, so this is really cool. So, yeah, this, uh, this will conclude my brief overview of RMS so far, but I plan on doing a part two after I test all these other um, API calls that are intercepted with RMS and I also want to test all these other features up here so yeah I hope you enjoyed my brief overview of RMS and I'll see you guys next time